It's such an honor to be here, and it's such an honor to introduce Douglas Rushkoff um, this morning and to kind of guide you through this day. Uh, Doug Rushkoff is so many things. Um, some of the words that come to mind are media theorist, writer, columnist, graphic novelist, documentarian, cyberpunk. He's published over 20 books and graphic novels. Um, his latest, Team Human, is out this year, and he'll be signing copies later on after his talk. He also has um, the ongoing Team Human podcast. Um, a fun fact that I found last night was that Rushkoff actually did VR for the first time in 1988 with Timothy Leary and Terrence McKenna, just to set kind of an image in your minds and just think of what that meant for them in the, the kind of these first moments of, of, of digital exploration in the VR universe and, and what kind of the collective trip that they were embarking on and what they were imagining, what they were projecting that this new digital horizon was gonna mean for the social space, for democracy, for culture. And since then, um, Doug Rushkoff has really accompanied us socially, like as a culture through the many conversations that have kind of built onto this technology and has accompanied us in cre creating vocabulary that allows us to kind of actively rethink and criticize and address the forces at play that are kind of gaining control and grasp over um, technology. So some of, some of the vocabulary he's actually equipped us with are words like viral media and digital native, um, for which he has credit, for <laughs> which is quite remarkable. Um, so he's just a terrific guest to set the tone for the next days and to kind of accompany us as we embark on this this the three days of conference planning. He's gonna he's just he's just such a great person to speak to the social, ethical, political, and especially like humanistic aspects of digital culture. His new book is a prescription, but also a manifesto of how to approach the challenges of the digital and network world. So thank you for being here, Douglas Rushkoff, and please um, let's all welcome him to the stage. <laughs> Thanks. Gosh. Yeah, I remember those, those heady days when, uh, if you don't know, Terrence McKenna was kind of the uh, psychedelics explorer, you know, with more with you know mushrooms and DMT and things like that. And what got him so excited after he played with uh, VR, and this was like VR at the graphical level of asteroids, you know, this is early stuff. And he said, Doug, do you realize with this technology, you will literally be able to see what I mean? Right, he thought that VR meant that we were gonna like be able to communicate the way squid do, with you know, dancing and then spread, you know, spraying ink and that that would be the sort of post-verbal, you know, uh, post, uh, post-literary way of uh, uh, communicating. And Timothy Leary said, Doug, well, he said two things. One, he said um, in exopsychology, he wrote a book called Exopsychology, where he said that the, hu the future of humanity would be, we'd be star, we'd star seed. You know, that, that uh, 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 space exploration was, uh, was where we would go, human migration into space. And he said, Doug, I was wrong. It's not migration into outer space, it's going to be migration into cyberspace into inner space. He thought that's where we would, uh, that's where the, the, the human mind would inevitably evolve. The other thing he said was that this, uh, he said this stuff is as powerful as acid. Only you don't need to take the tab. So this is what's gonna do it. And, but what, what I don't think he did realize at the time was, was as he would always say about psychedelics, that the quality of your trip depends on your set and your setting, right? It depends on the mindset that you're bringing to the psychedelic experience and the setting in which you're doing it. So if indeed the internet and virtual reality are as powerful as psychedelics, but if the set and setting we're using is extractive capitalism and surveillance and mind control, then no wonder 25 years later, we are having such a bad trip, right? We are, we are, a, a, thing. We are a, a civilization that has been living on a psychedelic substrate for three decades. 
you know, with no guidance, right, and with no, and with no frame other than Wall Street. You know, so we ended up with this profound reversal of human beings and their technology, which is really what I want to talk about most today, is how human beings are no longer the users of these tools, but we are being used by the tools. Right? We are no longer the figures. We are not the active players. And I've written books all trying to argue this in one way or another. I did one called Program or Be Programmed, arguing that if you're not programming the environment, you're being programmed by it. And everybody thinks that means, oh, now I've got to go learn C++. You know? And throw STEM in the schools. And no, it means that can you think critically about the environments that you're living in? Can you see that these are social constructions? Can you see that these are not, that these are not real? Do you trust the person who's made this environment? Which is why it's fun to come here. I mean, gosh, uh, uh, Montreal was the place I used to come after the original kind of rave scene of San Francisco and New York got commercialized. Something about, about you all was more resistant to that. You know, I never knew whether it was because you were you know, politically resistant and you understood, or just there wasn't enough money here for people to come and try to take from you. But both are good, uh, I suppose. And one leads to the other. But the, the weird thing is that, yeah, I mean, so 25 years ago, I'm this, I'm this kid doing psychedelics who, who, I mean, my first book, this book, Siberia, that I wrote about Rave and the internet and Leary and McKenna and John Barlow and the computer hackers, that book, I had written it for a big US company called Bantam, Bantam Books, you know, Bantam Doubleday Dell. I wrote that book in 91, and they canceled its publication in 1992 because the editors thought that the internet would be over by 93 when the book was supposed to come out. They said that the internet would be like CB radio, Citizens Band Radio, you know, breaker, breaker, you know, the, the, that people had, and it would, it would peak, that the publishing is too slow in industry to keep up with little trends like that. Um, yeah. Uh, so it ended up getting published, but, but I guess I ended up being accidentally or psychedelically correct about so many things that later um, the business people started to come to me. So I sometimes will get called to like do a talk for rich people about you know, the future of technology and all, because they're just looking for where to place their bets, right? Where, how to, had a, uh, had a bet on the future of tech, and I got invited to do this one talk. Um, again, I thought it would be about, you know, future of tech, whatever, and I use that always to propagandize. You know, I don't predict the future, but I'll, I'll tell them what I want to have happen so that they try to build that. But I got to this talk, and I was in the green room, and then instead of bringing me out on the stage, they brought these five men in to me, these five white guys who I found out later were all billionaires, and they sat around the table and told me, no, there is no talk, there is no thing. This is the talk. And it was them peppering me with kind of yes, no, binary questions about tech, like uh, uh, Ethereum or Bitcoin, VR or AR. You know, it was, it, it was, it, it was really weird. And then, Eventually, though, they got around to the real topic they were concerned about, and that was the binary. They said, Alaska or New Zealand? You know what that's about? Right? They wanted to know where I thought they should put their doomsday bunkers. And that was the real topic of the whole thing, was what the, we ended up spending most of the hour on the question, how do I maintain control of my security force after the event? And by the event, they meant the thermonuclear war, or social unrest, or economic crisis, or whatever it is that tore down society and made their dollars worthless. So how do you maintain control of your security staff? How are they going to protect your bunker and your eco farm and your underground god knows what if your money is worthless? And they were thinking about shock collars, or that they would be the only one that has the combination to the lock where the food is kept. And I tried to convince them that these were all really failing strategies. You know, if you, right, if you, 
it, I mean, look at any dictatorship. If the only thing protecting your place is your generals, then you have nothing protecting your place, right? Their generals are gonna, are gonna take over. And I facetiously tried to argue to them that what they should do is just like pay for their security guards' children's bat mitzvahs today, you know? Not that their security guards have Jewish children necessarily, but you, but you know what I mean, that was the first thing that occurred to my mind, that if you pay for your security guy's daughter's bat mitzvah reception, then later when you're in the bunker, before they kill you, they're gonna think, oh, but this guy paid for my daughter's bat mitzvah, you know? And their response was about the same, like you're ridiculous. Um, but the thing that, that, that occurred to me was that these guys, these billionaires, are basically, they're stuck. They're more stuck than any of us. They are trying to earn enough money to insulate themselves from the reality that they're creating by earning money in that way. But they're earning money through the most extractive, exploitative means and in ways that destroy the environment and destroy society. So because of that, they need to create these, you know, moats, these bunkers in which to somehow uh, protect themselves. And the biggest irony of all is that they're turning to a psychedelic cultural theorist for strategies on how to survive. Right, basically a trickster who's going to tell them how to commit suicide, which is probably a better path for them anyway. Sorry. They're killing us all, right? And may as well just kill themselves. No, I would really just give them, I gave them little Zen Cohens, you know, something that would get them just to chase their tail for a few years and do a little bit less, a little bit less damage. But how, you know, these guys who I would have before then seen as the most powerful people in the world, the billionaires, they see themselves as utterly powerless to influence the future. Now, I would think most of us in this room feel that we are capable of influencing the future. If anything, the only thing that stops us is we're wondering exactly how do we want to push society? What's going to be the best way to, to push things forward? These guys, with all this money, feel utterly powerless to change the underlying systems by which humans live. They don't even question them. The best they can do is to think, how can they position themselves for the inevitable crisis, for the, for the, for the moment where we hit the wall. You know, and they, are, they don't know how to access the moment that most of us access all the time or, or have lived through. You know, there was this, this moment of possibility in early internet, electronic, rave, EDM, you know, whatever we want to call this culture that we're a part of. You know, there was a moment when so many things were blossoming at once that it seemed as if reality was something that we were creating together, collaboratively. It was a moment of, of rave culture and digital technology and the psychedelic revival and computers and fractals and video games and fantasy role playing and hypertext and chaos math and the Gaia hypothesis. There was this unbridled potential for the human imagination to quite literally create reality in real time as we go. Now, the reason why Silicon Valley firms hired psychedelics users as their programmers in the late 80s and early 90s was because we were the only ones who were comfortable hallucinating a reality. For hallucinating a reality that would actually come into being. That was frightening. It was psychedelics people and kids, 12, 14-year-old hackers would program. And we had really an agenda of no agenda. I remember at some of the early raves I went to in England, in San Francisco, and I thought, oh, this is kind of punk, this is kind of political, fight the power. And they were like, no, no, that's all, that's all polarizing, that's all binary. This is an agenda of no agenda. You know, which for better or for worse, you know, there was some problems with that too. If ravers had understood the politics behind appropriating a public space for uh, collective activity, you know, it might not have been sidelined quite as quickly as it was. But unlike punk, which was, you know, fight the queen, 
rave the power of it and the power of these technologies was to develop an open source reality. Now for me, the, the big revelation happened when I was doing one of my first uh, uh, programs. These were terminal programs. You didn't even have a, a hard drive. And you had to save your program on the mainframe. And I remember the first time I had saved a file, you had to save it either as a read-only file or a read-write file. Those of you who are old computer people will remember that. It was like R or RW. It's a read-only or read-write, meaning can other people see the file or can they see the file and change the file? Can they read, can they edit the file when they come upon it? And that kind of changed my world because I realized so much of the world has been set up as read-only when actually it's all read-write. You know, where are the things that we're not allowed to read-write? From money to law, I mean, money, we, we call this stuff, you know, this is money, and it's, you're not allowed to write your own money, but why? Because there's a rule against it, not because you can't write your own money, right? We used to live in a world where everyone wrote their own money. There were grain receipts, there everyone, that was part of a small business empowerment, but no, they locked that down, and we were raised in a world where we think money comes from the central treasury, and now that's the operating system we accept, the closed source operating system. Well, all of these technologies, the original digital sensibility was about seeing what has been arbitrarily locked down, and what can we change, and so much we've broken, you know, from, uh, at least uh, in, in some circles, you know, with you know, gender and race and economics, we've come to understand that, oh wow, we've been living under really strange imposed limits. The problem with this, with this original digital sensibility, was that it was really not good for the market. Oddly enough, digital was bad for business. They did a study in the US in 1994 and they found out that the average internet-connected home was watching nine hours less commercial television a week. And that's war, right? The, the kids are using the remote control. They didn't used to have a remote. They have a remote and they're flipping from channel to channel. They're not sitting and passively watching their programming. But I saw this as empowerment. Look, they, they're, not gonna, they're not going to fall prey to the captive spell of a programmer. But what does mainstream media call this? They call this attention deficit disorder. Oh no, the kid has a disease. You know, from the, from the, the day that, I remember when Wired Magazine announced that we're living in an attention economy, Ritalin prescriptions, it's a speed for children, Ritalin prescriptions have gone up by 4,000% since then. Right? If you're living in an attention economy where attention is the only valuable thing, you're going to drug children to pay attention. And the reason they're not paying attention, I would argue, is not that they're sick. It's that they're adapting to a world where someone is trying to program them everywhere they look. So over time, the digital sensibility was rejected because it was bad for business. And instead, digital became a business. You know, think about the transition, if you were around, from the Mondo 2000 framing of the internet story and the culture story to the Wired magazine culture story. Mondo 2000 and reality hackers and high frontiers, they came out of sort of out of the, the neo-psychedelic pagan revival movement and married that with digital technology and rave and looked at, oh man, we can blow this culture wide open. We can do anything. We can make stuff. The world is, is being created in real time by us. Wired Magazine came around and said, oh, no, 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 don't worry. This isn't going to be bad for business. The real internet story is that digital technology will allow the economy to expand exponentially, uninterrupted, forever. That's what they said. With a straight face, they wrote a whole book called The Long Boom, which said that because of digital technology, the economy will grow forever and expand forever, and it's exponential. So it's gonna grow faster and faster and faster every year, and it doesn't ever have to stop. And even in America, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, Alan Greenspan, originally said, well, that's kind of uh, optimistic. Eventually he said, well, I guess this is it. We're in a new paradigm, he called it. But as we all know, nothing in nature grows exponentially. 
The only thing that grows exponentially is cancer. And it grows exponentially until it kills its host organism, and then it stops growing altogether. So Wired reframed, Wired in that, that San Francisco business sensibility, reframed the internet as a stock market opportunity. And once you're looking at things as a stock market, the object of the game is no longer to increase the creative possibilities, to cr increase human potential. No, once you're doing something, once you're betting on something, what you really want to do is increase the predictability. You want to have the greatest chances that the thing you're going to bet on is going to come true. So how do you increase predictability? By controlling human beings. That's really the story. So instead of creating digital technologies that open up possibilities, get people to act weird, and to explore the new liminal spaces between things, does this thing annoy you, the, the, the scrunching? Yeah, I'm just going to tilt it out a little bit, OK? I know you guys like it against the face, but yeah. All right. So we move from possibility to prediction. I remember the day that I saw this happening, the day I knew it, was the day that Netscape went public. Netscape was the original kind of Mozilla open source, you know, strange open, open source browser. The day that Netscape went public, that is that they, they issued stock on the stock exchange, was the same day that Jerry Garcia, the guitarist for the Grateful Dead, died. Coincidence? I think not. No. But to me, it was as if that's the day that the 1960s kind of hippie Woodstock values that were infusing digital culture, that those went away and the, the, the values of the stock market rose. And once we were in a marketplace, now attention becomes the commodity. So we create, instead of websites that are like tunnels and explorations and fun houses and places you get lost, the, the, the quality we were supposed to program, if you were a web designer, the, what we were supposed to make your website was called stickiness. You were supposed to create the stickiest website possible, as if the website is like flypaper and the user should get stuck to this stuff, right? Because the metric that we were trying to amplify was called eyeball hours. Think about that, eyeball hours. That's the number of hours that human eyeballs are stuck to your digital page. Is that a human flourishing, beautiful, wet, and wild, liminal, psychedelic space? No. This is captology. Literally captology. If you take computer science at Stanford University, which is where all the googly, twittery people go, <laughs> there's a department you will go through run by a man named B.J. Fogg called captology. Captology is when you take the algorithms of Las Vegas slot machines and use them in a person's news feed in order to addict them. Captology is the porting of behavioral finance tricks into digital technology in order to addict people to technology and then control their behavior. This is not conspiracy theory, this is the syllabus. This is what they learn. I've met the guy who invented this, the streak feature on Snapchat, which gets the 14-year-old girls to you know, try to maintain contact every single day. He feels guilty about it now. Oh, what do I do? I feel so bad. I did this thing. Like, dude, fucking asshole. I mean, <laughs> seriously, did you not think what you were doing? Did you not read the books? Did you not, were you not at all conscious? Right? We develop algorithms. It's funny, the algorithms we make are kind of like, uh, uh, from my, my pagan days, they're kind of like demons. Imagine, we're going to create something that's going to look for exploits in the human personality and then mine those exploits in order to get people to do things against their own best interests. That's possession. Right? I'm going to build, they're going to launch these little demons out there. Go find exploits in other people. When I was a hacker, an exploit was a hole you found in an operating system. Right? Remember those days? You'd find an exploit and then go into the shopping mall and raise the temperature by five degrees or you know, do some... That's an exploit. Now we have machines looking for exploits in humans in order to get us 
to dehumanize in order to get us to act against our interests. I mean, think about your smartphone. Why do we even call them smartphones? It's because every time you swipe your smartphone, it gets smarter about you and you get dumber about it. And if you want to get smart about it and take it apart and look in there and see what it's trying to do to you, you're not allowed to because the algorithms, the mind control and surveillance algorithms are protected, they're proprietary, they're inside black boxes. So it's allowed to know everything about you and you're not legally allowed to know what it's even doing to you. You know, instead, the, the smartphone is just reaching into your brain stem. It's doing whatever it can to get you to react as a, as a reptilian uh, 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 amygdala. Right? It's, it's doing whatever it can to circumvent your frontal lobe, your neocortex, even your mammal brain, and get you to go into fight or flight instant responses. And in order to do that, it has to alienate us from one another. The only way you're allowed to connect to another person is through a phone or through Skype. But you can't actually establish rapport with another human being through a piece of digital technology. The, even, even in the best Zoom Skype technology, you're not going to see through the screen if the person's eye, eye, you know, their, their irises are opening to take you in. You're not going to see if your breathing rates are syncing up, if they're making the micro motions with their head of agreement. So you're not going to establish rapport. You're not going to have the mirror neurons in your brain fire. The oxytocin's not going to go through your bloodstream. So you'll finish a Skype call. You'll know the person said they agreed with me, but your body didn't get that hit of oxytocin. So you don't know. So your body is saying, I don't think they agreed with me. Your head is saying they do. And all that's going to register as is distrust. Something was off. Your body doesn't know to blame the technology. All it knows is that 600,000 years of evolution, of, of evolutionary traits to establish rapport, they're not firing. It's not working. So we don't just trust the tech. We distrust the other person. And of course, the less we trust the other person, the more we're going to rely on the tech, the more desocialized we're going to be, and the more we're going to depend on the market to fill those places that other people aren't filling. You know, that's the anti-human bias in almost all of these technologies, because human beings are weird and unpredictable, and we migrate to the liminal spaces. So technologies that are trying to turn us into a marketplace are going to be necessarily anti-human. And even the aesthetics become anti-human. Talk to music producers. What are they doing to poor little Ariana Grande every day? They're auto-tuning her voice. Auto, think about auto-tune. I mean, it's fun if Cher's playing with it as like, oh, this is a comment. You know, even Rihanna kind of plays with it as if it's a slave thing. But what is auto-tune? Auto-tune is trying to take the human being and quantize us. It's trying to shave off the, the, the singer reaching up for the note or coming down in over the note. You know, that's called soul. That's, I mean, think about auto-tuning James Brown as he's reaching up for the, oh no, you're reaching up, get rid of that, just hit the note, hit the note, hit the note, right? And get the throaty stuff off there too. I'm sure we got a, a, a knob for that. So the stuff that stuff that lets us hear that human being reaching, that human being coming down over it, that human, the human, why is the human not hitting the exact note at that point? And what does that say about the performer's emotional relationship to the material and the melody line and what they're doing? That is considered noise, right? That's the noise, where as I see it, that's the signal. That's the actual signal between the humans. It's noise to the machines because they're not alive. But it's the signal for us. And this is an old, old bias, right? This is since the beginning of science, or what we call science now. I mean, science was kind of invented. The scientific method was Francis Bacon in the, the early Renaissance. And when Francis Bacon was defining science, when he was explaining what science was, he said, science would let us take nature by the hair, hold her down, and subdue her. Right? That's a rape metaphor. So science is here so we can hold down nature and subdue her because she's a woman and she's scary and she's unpredictable. 
right? And we're going to have everything described in simple cause and effect metrics. And even the folks now that are saying that kind of agree with me and say, oh, we've gone too far. So they, they started something called the Center for Humane Technology. You know, so it's a, the, the, the Google guys who felt guilty about what they did, right? They take their millions and keep that in the bank but, and keep their investments, but now they do the Center for Humane Technology. And that, to me, I don't know if you have them here. We, we have, like, eggs that you could buy from cage-free chickens, right? It's like humane eggs or humane chicken that's just the flesh in the store. So this chicken was treated humanely all the way from birth to the slaughter. So humane technology will treat human beings humanely as we manipulate them and, and suck out all their data and, you know, and deliver them to the market. Right? And that feeds back to this libertarian, to this libertarian urge. Right? The more dehumanized we are, the more we see each other as players to be, to be uh, uh, manipulated, the more that, that uh, affirms the values of neoliberalism and libertarianism. And they argue that, you know, evolution is ever thus. We are individuals competing for scarce resources. And, who, you know, may the strongest man win, caveat emptor, and all that. But it actually, that's a bastardization of Darwin. If you read the actual Darwin, the actual theory of evolution, he's not talking about the survival of the fittest individual in competition with all the other individuals. What Darwin is marveling at page after page is how species collaborate and cooperate in order to ensure mutual survival. I remember the day in middle school when the teacher taught us about trees and how the trees compete for sunlight and that the big tree will shade the little tree so the little tree dies and the big tree gets the sun. And then I read The Secret Life of Trees and I found out, no, it's the opposite. The big tree is getting the sun. It shares its nutrients through the soil, which turns out to be alive. It's a matrix of mycelia. It shares its nutrients through the soil to the little tree. And then in the, in the winter, when the big tree loses its leaves, the little tree shares its nutrients back with the big tree. And the mushrooms in the soil take a service fee for exchanging all the nutrients. So evolution is not survival of the fittest. It's evolution is a team sport. And that, I thought, is what Rave taught us back in those late 80s, early 90s crazy days. That Rave was about realizing and retrieving this, this collective, organismic sense of who we are. In some ways, it was meant as an affront to rock and roll, right? This was the original collapse of the you know, white male privilege thing. That rock and roll was about the long-haired white guy kind of masturbating with his with his strata, you know, they always kept the strat right over there, you know? It was like, what it was, I mean, it's beautiful in its way, right? Guys jerking off, it's wonderful. Um, <laughs> anyone who's jerked off knows. Um, it's not a bad thing in itself, but it doesn't have to be the, the linchpin of our society, right? <laughs> right, the beauty of the transition from rock and roll to rave was that it went from the performer to the participants. If you remember in that early era, too, the DJ was anonymous. No one knew who the DJ was, and that was part of the joy. They were just somewhere. It doesn't matter. It was the music. They were this sort of anonymous conduit feeding off the energy of the crowd. They weren't. Now there's actual high-paid DJs who come in with a fucking USB stick with the whole thing in it, and they're standing there pretending like they're, you know, mixing their crazy fucking shit, but they're not. It's like... But in the early days, the dancers, I'm sure in great raves now, and great performance, the, the dancers are the subject, right? The dancers are the figure, right? And the music is the ground. And I remember, you know, when you'd go to a great party, a great rave, like till four in the morning, whatever it was, you'd walk around the streets. Even here, I remember the, the, the next day I was walking on the street after some big rave, and I saw someone, I saw this girl who I didn't recognize from the rave, but I could tell from the way she was that she had been there. 
you know, and we made eye contact. We were walking on, what's that, Rue de St. Catherine, that, that street? We're walking across, and we made eye contact in that, and it, our eye contact said, you were there, I was there. It was like this conspiracy of people who knew something that the other people didn't. You know, it was, it was that we weren't part of the yuppie scum, you know, <laughs> that we were something else. It was maybe the illegality of the E in the scene partly helped keep it feeling, feeling real, you know, the same as any, any great music scene. But the weird thing is that eye contact moment that I had with that girl in, what, 1993 or something in Montreal... That's the moment I get now when I walk, on this, walk around in New York City and find somebody who's not staring at their device. It's like, oh, another one. You're awake. Yeah. It's like this weird body snatchers thing going on. That, that There's so few people. It's like, oh, you're a live one. Okay, good, cool. I see you. Ha ha. You know? And it's funny because even the word conspiracy, what does it mean? Conspire. It means to breathe together. But just breathing together in rapport with another person, that's a conspiracy today. Wait a minute, you're just, you're where, what are you, you're just sitting with somebody? No, but the weird thing was, and, and I, I, I don't blame anybody for it, but I feel like even with Rave, when I look back at it, the temptation to kind of do the acid test on people is really great. You know, we had all these lights, all this sound, all this stuff. It's really hard for the bias of that experience not to be, what can I do to people? You know, to act on people. It's, it's, it, and in some sense, because we believed that they needed, all oh, these people need to be broken. They need to experience this. They need to touch God. They need to know there's UFOs. They need to have colonial organism. You know, so we had the lights, we had the 120 beats per minute, we had the bass stuff, we're going to do something to you. Yeah, it was voluntary, it was participatory, but just like online platforms, we, we tend to take control of people's experience. And then the more we do that, the more focus becomes on us, the person making the experience, until we get to a place where a guy like Calvin Harris can make 280 million dollars mixing records for a Las Vegas casino. That's his contract. 280 million dollars is the contract he got. And when I saw that, 280 million dollars to Calvin Harris, you know, he was like Taylor Swift's boyfriend or something and produces whatever. I'm sure he's good. Um, but 280 million dollars, I thought, wow. Do we want $280 million for Calvin Harris to have a year at a Las Vegas casino? Or we could do 28,000 $10,000 raves. Could you imagine if we just did 28,000 raves of $10,000? The amount of cultural transformation you'd get out of that versus Calvin Harris at Vegas? Right? But what does that mean? It's because we, we surrendered the cultural transformation of these technologies for growth-based capitalism. And I get it, right? I get it. The, the EDM producers, or what, do we still use that term, EDM, electronic dance music producers, they're now subsidiaries of giant growth-based corporations. You know, just as any little company, any little dot com or any great idea that some kid has for an app, if they don't know what they're doing, they're going to make an app, and the first thing they're going to do is go to an angel investor or a venture capitalist who's going to tell them, oh, here's your money, here's your valuation, now pivot away from that sweet little idea you had for helping people, and let's get some of their data. You know, it's really, I mean, bless his little heart, it's what happened to Mark Zuckerberg. He was a college, he didn't finish college, and he turns to Peter Thiel. I mean, what do you, you give a 19-year-old kid to Peter Thiel, what do you think is going to happen? The guy is literally a vampire, right? <laughs> he is. He, he gets blood. He eats blood. Right? So the, 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 the kids, the users become the resource, not the subject. Rave becomes the opposite of what it was, consuming the participant. You know, and now I walk in, how do I even trust the DJ? How do I surrender my body to, to, to their tech? You know, and it's, and it's because they're trying to extract. 
Now, the funny thing is the technologists I talked to, some of the smartest ones, they still think that being somehow, five minutes, okay, um, they think, this, was, this says seven. Um, <laughs> the technology must be right. I will believe my tech over those humans, those pesky little humans. But that's the attitude, actually. That's the attitude at the heart of Google. Right at the heart of Google, you've got Ray Kurzweil, who says, no, no, we've got to go pedal to the metal. Ray Kurzweil is a singularity guy who believes that human beings are, you know, uh, uh, the best we can hope for is to upload our consciousness to the silicon chip because the day is coming when computers are smarter than people. That's called the singularity. And once that moment happens, when computers are smarter than people, then we should just fade into the background, pass the evolutionary torch to our silicon successors, and accept our extinction with humility. This is what he said. I was on a panel with him, and he was arguing that information is the real, uh, uh, is the, is the real figure of evolution. And information moved from atoms to molecules to cells to organisms to humans to culture and looking for more and more complex homes. And once computers are more complex than people, then information will continue its evolutionary ascent through tech and people, well, goodbye. And I remember I was on this panel and I argued, oh no, come on, there's a place for humans. Humans are weird. Humans can exist in the liminal spaces between one and zero, yes and no. You know, human beings can dream. We can imagine. A human being can can uh, uh, maintain um, uh, maintain uh, uh, paradox and amb ambiguity over time. A human being can watch a David Lynch movie and not understand what it means and still experience that as pleasure. Right? The, there, there's a place for human beings in the digital future. And he said, oh, Rushkoff, you're just saying that because you're human. <laughs> right? Like it's hubris. And that's when I said, fine, guilty. I'm on team human. Right? I'll be on team human. That's fine. I know we're not perfect. I know we've screwed things up. I know we destroyed the planet. But there's a place for us. There's, there's, we're weird. We're fun. We deserve a place. And that's where, and also, I started to realize, I mean, I, I was joking about it, team human, but the idea that being human really is a team sport, that we can't do this alone, that it's part of this collective evolutionary conspiracy, that we do this together, that we are, uh, there, there's no such thing as an individual. You know, that's what, that's what kills babies and makes people depressed, that what we have to do is, is, is see being human as a team sport and learn to see the human in the other, which really comes from another Timothy Leary quote. He, he was doing a lecture at Berkeley in 1968, and a young woman got up and said, oh, I had this psychedelic experience, and I've seen that the whole world is connected and we're all one. What do I do now? And he said, ah, find the others which is great. And to him, it meant find the others who've had that experience. And what it means to me now is find the others. Find the others, like in America. Find the person under that Make America Great Again hat and see where's the human being in there. Make eye contact. Find out what are they afraid of. What, why, why do they think that there's these borders are real and national boundaries matter? And what, wh Where are they at? Because you know, they're still human. So, you know, it's like, it's like we all make it or none of us make it. Because we can fall into that same billionaire's trap and thinking, oh, well, we're going to get to make it because we're part of this cool counterculture and we understand how people are connected. But yeah, if 30, 40, 50% of us are still afraid of other people and, and trying to be strident individualists, we got to figure them out. We got to help them. Uh, we got to help them uh, uh, become members of the team. You know, and that, I believe, is the real function, the real value of all these toys that we're playing with, of social media, of phones, of, of holography and lasers and immersive sound and VR and AR, right? Instead of using it to control people, right? We can use it for discovery, right? For participation, to break the trance. 
I'm always concerned about entertainment. I, it's great for people to have fun, but when you think about the word entertain, what does that mean? It means to hold within. That's what to entertain is, to entertain, to hold within, to kind of captivate, but in something. I don't think it's enough anymore to create experiences that entertain people. That's what the market wants us to do. Entertain them, hold them captive for a while so that we can show them an ad or so that we can, we can steal their data or so that they can go back to work the next day. No, what I want to do is make art and music that makes it hard for someone to go back to work the next day. Because they're going to look at, what the fuck am I doing? Who am I killing? What planet am I destroying? You know, wouldn't it be nice to go to work and know that little Greta would be proud? You know? <laughs> right? Oh, you're doing something cool. I mean, it might be impossible, but she's a tough, she's a tough cookie. You know, I mean, I understand when we create these experiences, you're, you're the artist and it's hard. And, and you've got an audience who expects very different things now. Kids come in, they can't even give you the 12 minutes attention to something without, like they want to check their phone or something or do a selfie or whatever. So you may have to acknowledge that they're on this device. Give them something to do with their phone because they're addicted. But... Do it to bring them back into the room. Do it to get them back on the stage or to participate in the thing. It's not just a, a you know, Lady Gaga T-Mobile phone ad or something. You know, which, what she did, she did a deal with T-Mobile. They did something and you can text her on stage and then maybe win something. No, no, no. That's not the thing. It's, it, you may have to acknowledge where your audience is at with relation to technology, their trust level and everything, and, and their addiction to hear, but... We have to create, we have to be conscious to create in everything we do more than empty sensory calories, you know? We have to give instead, we have to give them real social nourishment. We have to give them an opportunity to recalibrate in a world where all of the technologies that they're using are designed to decalibrate them. How do you recalibrate them to human and natural rhythms? And how do you use technology for that? Right? The world really could be ending right now. You know, that's what little Greta is on her way to explain to us. Right? I truly believe, I really do, that music and technology are not just entertainment. They're not just a pastime. They're not just a diversion. Right? They can contribute to the demise of our little planet. Right? Or they really can create the culture that helps us retrieve the social reality that uh, uh, you all in Montreal have, have been, been delivering to so many of us for so long. Uh, there's still a great deal of hope as long as you see the power of this technology to reconnect people to one another and to retrieve the values that, we're still, uh, uh, that are not gone um, but are in danger of being left behind if we continue uh, uh, on this exponential path towards market growth instead of the much more circular cyclical retrieval of, um, oh gosh, the indigenous values that we just opened this uh, uh, conference um, paying tribute to. So that's all I'm really saying. Instead of using technology to optimize human beings for the market, right? let's use technology to optimize the market and society for human flourishing. OK, thanks. <laughs> we, uh, do we have time for? So we have time for uh, Yeah, we have time, have time for for, for talking. Yeah, yeah. Raise questions your or hand. comments. Yeah, okay. right here. Hello. Uh, thank you so much for thank you. your important work and a very engaging talk. Um, I have a question that relates to you and one of the other uh, speaking teams that will be coming up during the conference, Jason Lewis and uh, his team at the Indigenous Futures Lab, mm. who write about um, the idea of making kin with the machines. And I'm really curious to know your thoughts about that and um, because the whole, the, your whole platform of creating a team human can be understood as a very anthropocentric uh, position. So what, what do you say about 
uh, this idea that we have put ourselves in this mess precisely because of creating divisions between humans and the so-called natural world and machinic world and, and so on. Um, I'm really one-sided on this, I think, in that um, I think that the, the mistake was the disconnection from nature and that connecting with machines is the wrong direction. You know, but that's just, that's just me. I don't think that machines are alive and I don't think they ever will be alive. That I, this is where it gets a little Catholic or Jewish or something. So, and this is just me, but I think that, that life has soul. And I think that the, our machines are, are, they'll never have that. That they'll be really com complicated or can even demonstrate complexity, like showing us a fractal or something, but that they'll never be conscious in that way. So, I mean, where, where I started thinking about this was after I watched a whole bunch of those kind of Terminator-like movies where the humans make these machines, these robots, and then they enslave the robots, and then the robots do bad things to us, I started to think that those movies are really just misplaced guilt for the slaves that we just had a couple of generations ago that were still pretending like it didn't happen. I mean, in America, maybe more so than here, we're so future focused. Everything's about the new and the new and go west and keep going. We just won't ever look back even to yesterday or the day before at the people that we trampled to get there. It's like we're, we're, trying, to, the, we're trying to make a car that goes fast enough so we can escape the fumes of our own exhaust, right? Without realizing that eventually you come back around the other side of the world. So it's natural where we were at, and I, I played with it too, late 80s, early 90s with anthropomorphism. Like you put rabbit ears on your, on your Mac classic and give it a name, and it's like this little thing. And that's a little sick, but, but healthy sick. At least what you want is the computer to be kind of alive, anthropomorphism. Where we've gotten now is what, what we could call mechanomorphism. Now it's human beings trying to be more like machines. Oh, my, I, my, uh, I'm going to get my, uh, you know, uh, uh, multiple attention. And, and I mean, all the metaphors we use for I can't process that and that we're trying to, to be kind of this always on optimized Tim Ferriss, you know, three minute nap, uh, you know, somehow use, use digital tailorism, you know, to, to, uh, 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 to optimize us, no. So, I mean, I look back, I believe that the digital, at its best, digital retrieves the medieval. That's what you're going to see. I mean, this is sort of Marshall McLuhan-esque, if you will. You know, what does a new technology or a new media environment retrieve? I believe that we are still in the midst of a renaissance, a renaissance as big as the last renaissance. Only what you do in a new renaissance is you retrieve the values that were repressed in the last renaissance. So in the last renaissance, we got rid of local currencies, we repressed women, we repressed nature, we uh, uh, repressed circularity for progress, um, and we turned science from holism into cause and effect science, literally breaking things down. So now the opportunity is to reconnect with nature and women and, and circularity and uh, permaculture and indigenous people and all the stuff that, that we... Uh, uh, forcibly, uh, forcibly repressed the last time out. But I don't think technology is it. I, I think that when we, when we look to technology for the emergent properties of nature, what we really get are like that new CGI Lion King. You know, and I know to our kids who are raised with CGI Lion King, that is going to be the jungle. That's the savanna. And look, that is a lion. And I looked at the lions in it, and they're perfect. Right? There's no little scars. There's no stuff. There's no dandruff. There's no, you know, uh, patches on, like, on a real lion. They're not perfect. They're, but at some point, it's like, well, what do you prefer? The perfect lion and the perfect savanna where you can go back home to your air-conditioned home? Or do you really want to go to Africa, you know? And at the same time, this movie is being produced by Disney, which is part of the military-industrial complex that is destroying the real Africa. So I get kind of like, I start looking at people like from Adorno and Benjamin to, 
to uh, Baudrillard and the postmodernists and say, oh my God, they were right. We are building a simulacra. And we're trying to convince ourselves that there is a soul in that simulacra, but I don't think there is. I think the simulacra is being built by extractive neoliberal corporate capitalism. And it's there to suck the, what remains of human life and, and nature. And yeah, if someday when we're more mature and more awakened, we can develop machines that can somehow house or reflect human soul, sure. But we are so um, uh, currently, I feel, incapable of doing that. That, the, the, that yes, we can do, you know, and some of the, the Engelbart and, and Bill Viola and folks talked about human augmentation through technology. I'm all for that, you know, and bionics and let's play. Give me a tail, you know. I'd rather have a tail than a third arm, if you know what I mean. I don't want more utility value. I want weird value, celebration value, you know, and that's, that's the place I would want to push this stuff. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, hey. the, for the presentation. It has been really, really interesting. I'd like just to put on the table um, another element that uh, in, I mean, in my career has been very important. I was working in the game industry for a long time, and I was really, really exhausted, uh, spending lots and lots of time instead of focusing on creative creativity and art, and you know, on how to how to excite the players. The the the, the point was the opposite that you were explaining. I mean, words like engagement, retention, so, you know, just get the people spending more understanding why the people spend less here and why, and what can we do to avoid that. So it means we are like uh, focusing on what could be sin sinister KPIs. I think we need to re reconsider more human KPIs. I think in your book, this is something that you also explain a little bit. And I, I think it's a good opportunity now to, 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 to put on the table the storytelling. I mean, maybe we need a different conversation and maybe creators, musicians, artists, uh, game designers also, they have a lot of responsibility instead of understanding that the, everything is done and they have to follow the path. No, there are as many paths as, as creators. So I mean, just feel self-confident to create your own path and mm -hmm. don't, don't take care, I mean, don't think about other people following. So what do you think about storytelling, digital storytelling as one of the potential solutions? Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of that in the, in the Team Human book too. This is like the other half of my, of my thinking career has been about narrative and looking at how really since Aristotle, we've used the male orgasm curve as the narrative arc of all of our stories and games, right? Crisis, climax, sleep. Crisis, climax, sleep. And you've got to get to the end. When do I get to come, right? When do I get to come? Level up, ah, level up, ah, right? It's always that. And that's fine, but it's, it's half or less than half of the story. It's a very particular goal or it, it goes great with corporate capitalism, it goes great with, with Christian evangelism, you know, ends justifies the means, go through this journey and then you get your reward at the end. And gaming, to the extent that it's followed that, I mean, that's what's made it that little boy kind of porn substitute or porn equivalent. And then when you look at games that don't go that way, when you look at uh, uh, well, gosh, a flower even. Remember that one? I mean, it's where you're just pollinating things or moving around and where, I mean, and, and any of us who really loved games, the thing that we loved about Mario World was, was I mean, like a PlayStation 1 era Mario World was just wandering around, right? Just because nothing's going to come kill you. You can just wander around in a world and see if they left any Easter eggs. You know, the old Warren Robinette adventure when you find, you know, after you get your key, you find that the, the, the thank you credits, uh, uh, that sort of Easter egg hunting, it's just a very different sense of reward. So I'm really interested in, um, in, in interactive experiences, immersive experiences, where the, the serotonin or dopamine release is less from conclusion than from connection when you relate this to that, when you've done pattern recognition. Because as you do pattern recognition, it becomes cumulative. It's this weird sort of learning, and then more patterns and more patterns and more openings and more openings. You know, it's, again, it's, you know, archetypally, it would be considered a more female kind of uh, 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 opening, a sense of, uh, of realization, but it's been re forcibly repressed, right, for a whole long time. So, yeah, we've got to uh, uh, make room for that. But, yeah, narrative is it. 
if we could get out of an apocalyptic narrative, if people could imagine a future other than zombies, you know, my gosh, but that's the only direction we can go when you think about, you know, that's a, the zombie apocalypse is really for most people a positive fantasy because there's no Twitter, there's no email, there's no bills, there's no taxes, just me, a shotgun, my family on a hill, slow moving zombies, not 28 days later zombies. That's bad, but slow moving zombies, you pop them in that thing. Um, that's what they want. That's what they want because they can't, they can't see a way out. And of course the way out is so easy. The way out is just connect with other people, look in their eyes, establish rapport. Rapport is the prerequisite to solidarity and solidarity gives us the power to change the world. Okay, we've got one last question right here. Hi, thank hey. you so much for your work and your energy. Thank you. My question has to do with the disjointedness between how we refer to the internet and technology, which is everywhere, ubiquitous, and you can't see it, and um, making visible what technology actually is, what the environment uh, feeds into technology, what people take physically, and the resources. Do you have any thoughts on how uh, we can make the outcomes of technology in terms of uh, environmental uh, destruction or consumption uh, more visible in common language? Well, it's becoming more visible in environmental language, right? We're starting to get the floods and the heat and see the death and the little polar bears and the millions of people migrating now in India and elsewhere. I mean, that's why they're building the wall in America. It's not about current immigration. This is a test run for locking down, you know, locking down the hatches. Uh, you're right. It was so much easier to know what the internet was when we went, when we used to go online. Remember, you'd go online, you'd have a modem, go online, and now we just exist online. But on the other hand, We've always lived in media environments. It's just, this is the new one, right? So we lived in a television environment, or even the, using spoken language or written language. That's still a media environment. That's why people go into a monastery and you take a 30-day uh, vow of silence. It's because you know that your brain on English or on French is going to be different than your brain off language, right? Because language makes nouns and verbs and subjects and objects. It's oppression is even built into the structure of the romantic languages. So how do you make, you know, the, the way to make that apparent seems to be to, uh, rather than to, to even focus on the technology or how are we going to put warning labels on different things or, you know, but, uh, and, I, and I got involved in this a lot because of uh, uh, I was I was in the early stages of viral media. I was kind of part of thinking up what that was, and now viral media became this real enemy. You know, memetics and Trump and uh, 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 evil evil memes and things. Um, I came to realize there's almost nothing we can do about the memes and technologies themselves. That I'm becoming less like an allopathic doctor and more like a homeopathic one. That what I'd rather do is increase the immune system of the cultural organism. So that the more people can make eye contact with each other, engage with one another, the, the more healthy we can make our social reality, then the more apparent all of these systems will be. Because as I see it, digital technology and the Internet of Things are, cannot be extracted from corporate capitalism, cannot be extracted from you know, Renaissance era uh, science and, and control. So there's no way to keep up with what the technologies are doing. The best we can do is to enhance our human systems and what you get, and I have it now to a large extent, what you get is a really good sense of the EBGBs. You know, you walk into something and it's like, ugh. You know, that natural sense of unease or dis-ease is really our best friend now. And it doesn't mean you feel the disease and you have to run, but feel the disease and go, okay, why am I feeling, what is it that's, where is this pushing me weird and how, how do I relate to that? You know, and that's, that becomes powerful, you know, the more, but the, the only way to have that, you can't have that alone. 
right? You can only really get that when you're with a friend and you have someone to calibrate off and to say, was that weird? Does this, something feel strange? Does it feel weird to you? It's like, uh, that's, where, that's where that comes in. I know that's not a great answer to the question, but it's the only one, I mean, I'm not particularly optimistic now. You know, I'm hopeful, but I'm not optimistic because we're not um, waking up quite quickly enough or healthily enough. And it's really hard to wake people up when the car is already going off the cliff. It's like you're asleep at the wheel. We went off the cliff and it's like, okay, wake up. You know, it's just like, what do we tell them to even do at that point? You know, so it's, it's, a, it's a tricky one, but, but that's, that's the challenge. Just my only answer at this point has been, and I've gone from someone who's saying, teach them more about tech, teach them more about tech so they can know. And now I've kind of given up on that one and I'm back to liberal arts teach them how to think critically about the world in which we live, how to deconstruct what's going on, how to understand what role am I playing in this, and is it making me more human and connected and grounded, or is it making me less so? And if it's less, then here's something I want to investigate. All right, good. But thank, for, thank you so much for having me and for, for what you do. You know, I'm just, I just appreciate you. Thanks. Thank you so much.